What was the greatest lesson your mom taught you growing up? She doesn't know how much she taught me because she wasn't much in the teaching mode. My dad took her soul. Mm. But what I did as a young kid is I observed everybody. I wasn't really smart in the books, but I was real smart when it came to life. And I was able to sit back and watch her mistakes. I was able to see how she struggled through life and how I don't want to struggle through life. The biggest thing she did for me, when I would bust my ass, when I would fail, when I was at the bottom of the sewer, she never picked me up. She never gave me that cookie and said, hey son, you know, it's, it's gonna good, be okay. Yeah. She, never, she didn't have time for that. Sometimes she gets upset when I talk about my past because it, it, it paints her out to be the best mom. If I had any kind of mom in that kind of environment, I would have never made it. Because she forced me for every reason to you better figure this out or you're gonna be a statistic. And this is something that she didn't sit down and tell me. I realized this. This is the world that is in front of me. And what most people do is they see this world and they look at it as an excuse to get out of it. I have all these valuable lessons because if you look out in the world right now today, it's not a nice place. But I'm very prepared for it. I'm prepared <laughs> for it. I'm prepared for all the failure coming my way. I'm prepared for everything my way. And that's the biggest lesson that she taught me by not teaching me. By never saying it's going to be okay. Yeah. Matter of fact, she told me the exact opposite. Life sucks. That's what she knew. And it was the truth. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 video with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because as a young entrepreneur, I struggled to keep my business going. I had no friends, I had no mentors, I had no role models. And the thing that saved me was learning from the success stories of famous entrepreneurs. And in their stories, I got motivation, and I also got strategies for what I could do to grow my business and not stay stuck. And I still need their stories for motivation today. So today let's learn from one of the best, David Goggins and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two is find your strengths. If you really can't hurt me, I go into, into detail about my first 100 mile race. The, the race I wasn't trained for at all. And I went out there and ran 100 miles on a one mile track. When I got to mile 70 and everything went south, I mean, it went south. I've been through three hell weeks, ranger school, some of the world's hardest training in the world, and this was the most pain I've been in my entire life. When I sat down in that chair and went to the bathroom myself and everything went south, when I had 30 miles to go and I was in the worst shape of my life, and I won't get too deep into it, but when I was able to go 30 more miles, in the worst shape of my life. That's when I talk about it in the, you know, you can't hurt me, the whole mental governor, the whole mental governor got removed. And that's when I realized that a human being is able to do some of the most, you know, horrific things out there. We are, we are built very different. Like a lot of us, you know, we're, we're, we're taught everything, how to read, how to write, how to drive a car, how to cook, how to clean. But very few of us are taught how to survive when the rug gets pulled from underneath us and we have to find more. Very few of us are taught how to fight. And at that moment, that 30 miles was about 10 years of life that I lived in 30 miles. And I learned how to fight in the, most, in the, in the hardest of times, in the worst shape of my life. Well, number three is change your mindset. I gained about 50 pounds back. I was about 250 pounds. This is a story about the mind. I'll go through it real quick. So I didn't put running shoes on for about nine months, 10 months. I was overseas deploying, came back with the free fall school. I was at military free fall school with Morgan the Trail, Marcus the Trail's twin brother. We got the news that an incident happened where everybody died and they couldn't find Marcus the Trail. So I got the call. My job was to tell Morgan the Trail, his twin brother, who was also a Navy SEAL, that his brother might be dead. Four days later, they found Marcus the Trail alive. What I did was I went online, Google's, you know, different events. Th this event came up called the Badwater 135, burn 35-mile race to Death Valley in the summertime. I didn't know that was even humanly possible to run that far. I thought it was a stage race. I thought you'd like put your shoes on, ran 15 miles, set up a barbecue, camped out, and then did it again the next day. It was a 40-hour race. I went out there and basically to, to raise money for the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. So I called this guy up named Chris Costman. Chris Costman was a race director. He said to me, basically, you have to run 100 miles in 24 hours or less to qualify. I never run past 20 miles in my entire life. And up until now, I probably ran 20 miles this entire year. So he says, I call him up on a Wednesday. He says, you know what, there's a race on Saturday. 
And if you run 100 miles in 24 hours, I will consider you my race. So I wasn't real smart growing up, and obviously I wasn't real smart right now. <laughs> so I did the math, the math like a little, you know, less than 15 minute miles. So I said, you know what, I can walk this. Dumbest decision I made in my entire life. <laughs> Went out there about 250 pounds, and I get to mile 50. It's, so it's in San Diego, November, so on a one mile track. Where you, where you go as you know as many times as you can around one mile track for 24 hours. I get to mile 50 in about 12, 13 hours. I sit down. I sit in this blue lawn chair. I saw my ex-wife every single mile. I got Ritz crackers in Myoplex with my nutrition. I was a muscle head, so I drank a lot of Myoplex back then. So basically, here I am drinking Myoplex Ritz crackers. By mile 70, I haven't gone to the bathroom one time. No water. That Myoplex tastes like hell, and the Ritz cracker is a ball in my mouth. This is where I really realized that, so I'm already a Navy SEAL. This is when I realized that we only use 40% of our mind. This is when I started going crazy with mindset and being a scientist of the mind. We go, I'm at mile 70, I look at my ex-wife, we sit down and I have to go in the bathroom for 12 hours. What must you do? Go to the bathroom. So I sit down and I look at her, it's the first we're going in my entire life. Seven hours, I'm happy, I'm feeling good. And I can't get up to go to the bathroom. It's literally for me to end the stage. So I look at her and I said, honey, do you love me? She goes, why? I go, because I can't stand up. My blood pressure's all messed up. I go, I'm sick of shit on myself right now. So I went back on my back and I started peeing blood down my leg. And my wife, my ex-wife's like, oh my God, you gotta stop. This is when I realized throughout my whole life, all the bad times, all the good times, you know what, I'm not gonna quit yet. Let me get better, let me fix my blood pressure. Let me get some potassium, sodium, nutrition in my body. Let me see if I can fix myself. So I said, if I can just walk one more mile after being in the worst shape of my entire life, this would change everything for me mentally going forward. From this kid who came from dirt and nothing, who couldn't read until he was in a junior in high school and is now here, I went, I walked a mile. I said, hmm, maybe I can walk one more mile. Maybe I can walk another mile. At mile 81, my ex-wife looked at me and said, you're not going to make the time. When your mind knows it's not going to quit, and this is what I found out, this is my 40% rule, when your mind knows it's not going to quit, your body will adapt to whatever is in front of it. I ended up running 20 more miles, I did 101 miles in 19 hours and 6 minutes, and that one day changed, that one 19 hours, it wasn't SEAL training, it wasn't Ranger School, it wasn't Delta Force, it wasn't any of that crap I went through. It was this 19 hours and 6 minutes that forever changed my life to know that we as human beings are capable of anything and we don't need any special kind of parents or tools to get there. Rule number four is be honest with yourself. Well, some of you read that I think about when it's hot outside that it's sunny and 70. Well, it's not today. It's the reality. If it's about 90 degrees and 100% humidity. But who gives a shit? That being said, September 3rd, I have to have my book turned in. And what I realized, I'm reading this book a lot. What I realized, I wasn't born this I made them. At the bottom of insecurities, fear, self-doubt, lies, was me buried in the fetal position. How I got out of that was recognizing it, being honest with it, being truthful with it, and then fixing it. We like to live on social media, with lies about ourselves, how great we are, get to the source and fix the problem. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free there's a link in the description below go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business i'll see you there well, number five is stop caring what others think i read your book and you've overcome a lot from your upbringing so my question is when you stop blaming your dad and maybe not for gabe but when you stop giving him the power away for why you were the way you were what did that do for you as a person and as a father well it did a lot for me as a person 
It did it did a lot for me as a as as a person, as a man, as a as as everything. So once you realize where you come from, so I was you know, I went back and I faced that. I faced my father, and by facing my father, it allowed me to realize, you know, because as you're growing up, you know, you you may look at your dad or your mom or whoever it may be as like they're not human or they're just evil. No, they are human, and they also came from, you know, maybe a bad childhood. So I was able to really go through and really dissect my father. And by me dissecting my father, I got a lot of answers on why I was so weak, why I was so pathetic, why I didn't want to go be better. And, but that said though, my father's demons had to go somewhere. So they went to me and my brother and they went to a lot of other people. You have to realize that you have to now solve for your demons and solve for his for you to move on. So when you get that kind of strength, when, you, when you're able to look at these demons eye to eye and say, I'm not going anywhere, I'm gonna face you every single day, what happens is you start to callous that mind. You start to realize that all the bad things you went through, it doesn't matter anymore. I know where I'm going and I'm focused on getting there. So it just starts to, and, and once you stop caring about what people think about you, and once you stop caring about where you came from, if it was a bad place, you become very, very dangerous. Very dangerous. Rule number six is face things head on. What the hell are we all waiting for? To start attacking life. We're waiting for the stars to align. Back when I was growing up, the song came out. All I need is a miracle. Well, guess what? That miracle ain't coming. There is no perfect time to start. You gotta start now with changing your life. We're all being tested in life. And guess what? This is one test you can't cheat on. We all have our own test. Some of us are obese. Some of us are depressed. Some of us are insecure. In the military, we had this big old rucksack on the back. Had batteries, water, extra gear. Your extra gear is the shit you're dealing with in life. And the only way to overcome it it's for you and you alone to face it. You have to do your best work when you're at least motivated. So those days you don't want to do it, guess what you got to do? You got to suck it the f*** up and do it. Stay hard. Rule number seven is examine your soul. I'm not a very known athlete. I'm not a professional athlete. I'm an underground athlete. Uh, I didn't do anything to accept these amazing awards. I did it because basically I grew up in a very tough, tough life. Um, lived in a horrible place, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Got beat down so bad by my father that he beat the courage and strength out of me. So I had to find a way to kind of get it back. And how I did that was literally examining my, my soul. So in doing that, I started looking for the most uncommon people in the world. So it brought me into special operations. Um, from the Air Force to the SEALs to Rangers. And along the way, I started realizing how powerful the mind truly is and how little we use of it. So when I was getting beat down, I thought I was nothing. I thought I was the lowest form on earth. And to develop my mindset, what I did was I started joining special operations unit, you know, looking for these courageous men. And I found them. And when I found them, I started realizing that it's all in your head. The most important conversation is the one you have with yourself. You wake up with it, you walk around with it, you go to bed with it. Eventually, you act on it. And my conversation was a bad one. So the people who I thought were up here in my life, these uncommon men, I was putting myself down here. But over a period of time, I started realizing that I'm also uncommon. And I started pissing those uncommon men off by realizing that we all have this ability in our mind. Rule number eight is engage in physical activities. You work out every day, you haven't missed a day. I do it for the last 20, 20 some years of my life. 20 years or did 20 say some two years? years? No, 20 some years of my life. 20, every day you work out. So I used to take one day off a week. Uh huh. I used to take one day off a week. For the body recover, right? Makes sense. But that one day off was an active recovery day where I would get on a trainer and ride for like two hours. Wow. But at a, at a zone one heart rate very low heart rate, and I replace the carbohydrates in my body while I rode, because the best way to recover for me is to do something at a very low heart rate, because therefore your blood's flowing through your body. Yeah. As your blood's flowing through your body, refuel it with the nutrients 
because then your blood's flowing, the nutrients is going through all your cells in your body. All that glycogen is now flowing at a low heart rate. So it's not burning it, it's refueling it. Yeah. So every Sunday used to be that. And it kind of snowballed into, as human beings, we believe, like to, so many people, before I give them a workout plan, they're talking about recovery. Everybody, everybody that hears me speak, they want to go straight to recovery. Work out first. Huh. Work out first. <laughs> before you talk to me about recovery. How to recover, yeah. Work out first. Number nine is keep pushing. So a lot of you know that my knees are messed up, but that doesn't mean you don't stop going, you don't stop pushing. Life's about improvise, adapt, and overcome in every situation that's in front of you. A lot of people hate that message that I say continue pushing, continue finding your new 100%, continue finding your best self. If you don't like that message, this is not the place to be. I'm about people trying to find the best they have, not making excuses, overcoming any and all obstacles. So today, I can't run. I can't do much. But you can guarantee one thing. David Goggins got the after. He got the after. I don't give a my knees don't work. I'll find something else that does. Ha <laughs> ha! Stay hard. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is enjoy the journey. Hi, David. What do you think about people who are doing? using Ozempic for weight loss? Um, you know what? I'm all about people doing what they need to do in life. That said, um, I think that they're missing a big part of weight loss. For me, you know, I lost 106 pounds. I was almost three years, I was 297 pounds. And the weight loss journey itself, it's a journey. It takes you through this maze. It's not a straight line. It takes you to this maze of emotions. One day you may lose a pound, one day you may gain a pound. It's a fight. And the only way you get better is through the fight, through the struggle. If you do things like that, oh, I lost it real quick, you're not getting the full benefit of the hard work that it took to get there. And through that hard work, you don't forget that. You don't forget those months, those years it took, all those workouts, all those, all those uh, diets, drinking tons of water, going to bed early. When people go out to dinner, you gotta ask the chef to make the, your, your damn meal special. All those things are not fun. And that is where you grow. So when you take these weight loss pills, do what you want. I don't give a damn. But what happens is you miss the biggest part. The biggest part of the weight loss is what happens to your mind along that horrible journey. So I got stronger, I got better. If you want to take the weight loss pills, do you. So that's what I think about it. And I started with uh, very small goals. You know, it wasn't like I went out there and well, I started out real big, and I realized that the big goals were just crushing me, you know, because they weren't happening fast enough, and I had to start making big things very small, and I had to take a lot of pride and a lot of uh, self, a, a lot of satisfaction from the fact that, you know, I had to lose 106 pounds in like less than three months. Wow. Which was an impossible task for anybody to do. So instead of looking at 106 pounds, man, I was happy to lose a pound. I was happy to run a quarter mile because you know how it is as a, as a power lifter, man, you're not running anywhere. <laughs> yeah. you know, you're not, you know, I, mean, I mean, for me, when I was a power lifter, man, I was so crazy about calorie content and losing calories that I hated even walking to the refrigerator. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to lose, I didn't want to lose any calories because I knew losing calories meant losing strength. <laughs> so I, I was, I was a freak about all that stuff, man. So I had to totally flip my mindset about all that stuff and just find very small goals and, Start achieving and being proud of myself through those small goals that I accomplished. The one second decision is I had to live through that one second decision several times during this race. So this race took me a hundred and some hours. Okay. And this is what people don't get. For you to finish that race, even though I DNF'd, I still finished in the time. So there's a lot of pride in that. So what I do in that one second, because we all think about quitting when it's hard. But what you have to do in that one second is hard to process information during pain because that pain takes over and you can't think rationally. You're thinking about fight or flight, save yourself. That's not a rational thought. 
It's not a thought that's going to get you through hard times. Most people fail that one second. So what happens, what I do in that one second, it's a, and there's a bigger process to all this, but in that one second, I physically stayed in that water. Because if I get out of the water, I quit. So I physically stay in the water, but mentally, I'm on the beach with the instructors. And the instructors, it's cold outside, so they got these parkers on. They got their cup of Joe, and they're warm because they've already been through it. So now it's your turn to go through it. So mainly I get back with them. I'm still in the water physically, but mainly I'm back with them. I'm chilling. I got my parka on. And now I'm thinking logically because I'm warm now. Mentally, I'm warm. I've taken that one second. Let's not quit yet, Goggins. Let's think about your options. Where are you going to end up if you quit this? Where are you going to go? Where are you going to say to yourself? Because you know you're going to get warm. The second you get out of this water, you're going to take a shower and you're going to be warm. And you could be, and in five days, you could be out. So I start thinking logically. I calm my brain down because your brain just wants to get the f- out. Ring the bell, push your helmet down, get warm. And then you're really f- And these are the things you have to think about the one second decision. So that's what that's all about. It's about gaining control of your mind, putting things back in the proper perspective, and then saying, I really do want to be here. And I'm going to have a bunch of these one seconds through this 130 hour journey. And I have to learn to control these because if I fail one of these one seconds, I will not be a SEAL. I will not be a doctor. I will not be a lawyer. I will not be whatever the fuck it is. So that's how important that one second decision is. It's all about your mind takes control of you. You have to say, fuck you, I run this. And that's what that's all about. I realized that God wasn't going to give me a get out of jail free card. And from the time I was born until the time I was 19 years old, my life had these hurdles. I constantly hit obstacles, obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And I, I had to figure out how to manage suffering, how to, how, like, how to deal with it, because it'd be part of my life forever. At least that's what I thought. So in order to deal with it, I had to be able to conquer it and overcome it and deal with it and know that in this suffering, there has to be some kind of growth. With every obstacle, I look at it as friction now. Without friction, there is no growth. You have to have friction in your life to grow. So I start looking at all these different things versus the what was me mentality. Like, oh my God, look at my life. My life's so f***ed up. I come from this f***ed up family. I'm being beaten. I'm, I'm being abused mentally, physically. I start looking at it as a, as a perfect trial ground. So I had to flip it upside down and say, okay, I'm suffering tremendously, mentally. Use this to your advantage versus your disadvantage. So that's what I did. Versus looking at it as like, oh my God, what was me? I'm never gonna get out of here. I looked at it as, okay, hang on a second. Hang on a second. If I can overcome this, if I can find some power in this, some way to get through this, that right there will be the fuel for the rest of my life. And so I found great strength in suffering. Great strength in it because why? Through all of that, it started to callous my mind over the victim's mentality. This whole thing about suffering, <laughs> yeah, it sucks. Really bad. Uh, really, really bad. But we all live on this side of suffering. On this side. This nice box that's very comfortable that we know when everything's going to happen. We're in it. It's good. We know how everything's going to turn out. It's those few people who are willing to go on the on this side of suffering. And once they get through that, ask him how he feels now. His mind, how far he grew. In that short period of time, he grew so much more than the normal person because he was willing to go outside himself. Because on the other end of suffering is greatness. It's not over here. So a whole bunch of us, we put ourselves in this great box. And in that box, there's no suffering in it. So what we do is we, is we, is we shelter ourselves from greatness. So for me, for instance, I was 300 damn pounds at one time in my life. Sprayed for cockroaches, made $1,000 a month. I was living in that box. I would sometimes look over the box and I saw hell, suffering, storms, avalanches, tornadoes. I don't want to go over there, but I knew if I can get through that shit mentally, 
On the other side was a 185 pound person who's a Navy SEAL, went through Ranger School. Only person to do this, only person to do that, only person to do this. But that's through all of that shit. All that shit I have to go through. So you, so, so you peek over the box and you go back in and say, oh, I'm okay being 300 pounds making $1,000 a month. Right. I'm okay over here. And on the other side is where you start to really start your journey. People think they start their journey because they're born. No, there's a lot of people in graves who have lived 100 years and have never started their real journey. Your real journey starts when you go outside that box and you start climbing mountains and start climbing mountains. And you think you're at the top of the mountain, you go down the other side of it, you think, I'm here, and you look up, there's another mountain. And it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. And just when you're getting ready to quit, you crest that final mountain, you get down and you look, and there you are. And it starts to make sense to you then. It doesn't make sense to you until you get outside that box. I'll talk to so many people, and what I say is not for everybody. So many people don't have any clue on what the fuck I'm saying because they're in this box. And it's their brain. You first must go through suffering to find that great peace we're all looking for. A lot of us want to have, there's a lot of books out there about this five steps. Do this, do this, do this, get there. No, man, it's not that easy. To find real permanent peace and enlightenment, you must go to the dark side of who you are. I could have easily just shoved my whole life under a rug and went straight to peace. Are, are you happy there? You overcame nothing. You jumped hell, you skipped hell, for, you, you forego this part of your life, you skip it and go right to peace. So you always have this thing back here that's haunting you and that's that darkness. You must go into the darkness to truly find that light that you're looking for. Because that's what's on the other side of that. People get it all wrong, man. You, you have to face suffering. You have to face this dark side, this darkness. And there's a lot of energy in there. There's a lot of goodness in there that you can use to find greatness. But you cannot find your peace you're looking for in yourself until you've overcome yourself. What's your purpose right now? My purpose right now is to continue. I used to have a wash rag when I did this. And you know how you take a shower, you have a wash rag and a cloth and you, uh, you're you sitting there and you're just lathering up and before you hang your rag up, you wanna get all the water to come on it and you know get it all, all, that, all, you know, all the suds out of it. And you wanna wring it out and you wanna hang it up. So my big thing is when I live my life, I wanna make sure that when I'm dead and gone, that I wring that wash rag out and that wash rag is my soul. And I also believe that we're gonna end up one day meeting a maker if you believe in one. And I believe that maker knows everything about you. Everything about you. Knows I was gonna be here and talking to you. Knows everything. But you also have a choice to make. You have a choice to make. We have choices. And the one thing that scares me to death in my life is getting to heaven and not being what I was supposed to be. And I believe that God has a chart and he looks at the chart and he puts it in front of you when you get to heaven. He says, hey, this is what you're supposed to be. And one of my biggest fears in life was to see that chart and not have every block checked off. Mm. You know, I wanna make sure that I'm constantly pursuing whatever it is I'm pursuing just to be the best I can, just constantly grinding myself into a fine powder. Mm. You know, and, but doing it in a smart way, like I talked about, you can constantly grind yourself into a point where you're just sick. There's a, there, there's a happy medium of grinding, so that's, that's, that's my purpose now, to continue to push myself so others can see what is possible. You talk about the importance of having the right people in the foxhole with you. How do you know who the right people are? You know what? That's, that was something that took me a lot of years to figure out. You know you're the right people in your foxhole when you're waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're going to bed at midnight, and you're waking up at 3, and no one says, is this smart to do? You need some time off. You need to take a break. When I start hearing that well, I know what I'm doing to myself. I was behind the power curve, man. When everybody starts off in first grade, I had them negative grades. I started off in the dungeon. Man. I, I had to dig out of the damn grave to get the first grade. So now when you're 20 years old, where well, everybody graduated high school and all sorts, man, I got to make time up. 
So while people think 24 hours is one day, for me it's three, four, five days. I got to make up time. I'm behind. I got to go to summer school in my mind. When a who's with me realizes this has got to go to summer school in his mind, he's got to make up time. He needs 22 hours of the 24. And they just get it. He's trying to go somewhere. You are the right person for my foxhole. I don't want to hear no shit about resting. I can't rest right now. I don't want to hear no shit about what I'm doing to myself. I know what I'm doing to myself. Did you see how I came up? I got to catch up now. And that's what life is about. Sometimes you are raised in a position where you are behind. We have to make that time up. I'm sorry. It may be inhumane. You may be unbalanced. It may not look right to you. I don't give a f It's the situation that life put me in. And I need people to say, when I don't want to get up at 3 in the morning, I need a m in my life that sees me go to bed at 12 and wakes me up at 3. Saying, you need to get this done. That's the foxhole. I don't need critiquing. I need pushing. I need pulling. I need anger. I need passion. I need drive. I need them, man, those bad days. I don't need somebody in my ear saying, man. Because then that's all a person needs is that. Support can go a lot of ways, man. It can go a lot of ways. The biggest one I would say is never pick the easy road. Mm. Never. Never. And it always goes back to kind of the hero mentality. Never pick the easy road. Ever in your life. That is the one road that is doom. It is doom. If you want something like six minute abs, all mm -hmm. these different things, if you want it so fast, mm. you're, you may achieve what you wanted. But you want the permanent fix. The permanent fix comes from the hard road. The hard road gives you permanent results. Mm. The easy road gives you the quick fix. You will go back to where you started on the easy route. That hard route is so permanent that it ends up callousing you everywhere. Everywhere. You keep a six pack forever. You keep, yeah. it. <laughs> you keep it. Because you know the work that goes yeah. into it. Yeah. You state that when you're living in hell, the only way to find your way out is to confront the devil himself. You know, who, who was that right. devil for you? It took several years for me to figure out who the devil was. And the devil was my father. The devil was my father. But what I didn't put and never finished was the devil really was me. So what happened was I put all this blame. And trust me, my father and a lot of people had to do with my upbringing on how it was. But like I put in that book, no one's gonna come back and say, hey man, I apologize. Maybe someone does. Very few people will. So at the end of the day, when all things are said and done with, while my dad was the devil, and I believed that for a long time, I had to, I had to confront him. And when I confronted the devil, so what I thought was the devil, I realized that I was the true devil. I was the one holding me back. I was the one looking for the escape goat. And you know, I was the one looking for all these ways to say, it's okay, David. You're a loser, you're a born loser, so it's okay. And I was hoping my dad was gonna give me that confirmation. And he was a loser himself, but at the end of the day when I left there, I realized, well, shit, man, it's on me. My dad's up, my mom's up, the people around me are up. They're not gonna save you. You gotta save yourself, my friend. So that's when all that reality hit me when I went to Buffalo to see my dad on that drive home. I was like, man, this rest of your life is going to suck. It is going to suck, not because you're going to be a loser, but because you're going to finally start to win. And winning is not easy, my friend. What got you up out of the chair? Honestly, I create this thing called the cookie jar as I went through my suffering in life to become who I was. And the cookie jar was every time I failed everything so many times in my life and failure and I would succeed. I would fail and I would succeed. I had to figure out how to succeed through failure. And I put a bunch of cookies in the cookie jar. The cookie jars are things when I start to get the woe was me mentality, which we all still get, even though, even though you could be very successful, I reach in and I say, oh, this is my childhood. 
And this is what I did to overcome that. Because a lot of times when you're in hell, you forget how great you really are because at that moment, you're suffering. So you don't, you don't think about the great things that you've done. I take time to really calm my brain down when it's stressed out and remember where I came from and say, okay, no, we can do this. Mm -hmm. We can do this through a calm, patient mind, figuring out how to do it. So I figured out how to do it, how to get salt, electrolytes, get some food, get some hydration back in me, get my blood pressure to the point where I can stand up. That was the first mission. My definition of greatness is this. It's not a definition, it's an example. Mm. This is greatness, true greatness. Let's say that I'm the greatest tennis player of all time, okay? Let's say that, I hate tennis. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say I'm the greatest tennis player of all time. And I did 22 years, I run all the Grand Slams, I have all the, I beat Roger Federer, I'm, mm-hmm. I am the best ever. And we're having an interview, and you're talking about my greatness, mm-hmm. what I achieved, Now I'm retired. Don't play tennis anymore. Haven't touched a racket in years. And you're making me go back through my life. You're kissing my butt about how great I am. And I'm answering your questions. Every question I'm answering it. I'm with you. But in the back of my mind, all I'm thinking about is all the times I could have won those matches that I lost by not bringing my best mindset. Mm. You're haunted by all the opportunities that you missed by not bringing your best at that time. When you could have won, but you didn't win, because you allow life to interfere yeah. with that one shot. When you're sitting there getting ready to serve for the match and your mind is not thinking about where that ball placement needs to be, but it's thinking about your family this, or this at work, or that at work. Mm-hmm. That's greatness. Greatness is your recall on every single shot wow. that you missed throughout a 20 some year career. Every shot, you can go back and say, I was here. This person was in the red shirt there. Greatness is being so aware of the time of life in the second that went by and you can recall like it was yesterday. Greatness is being able to go back there, not making that same mistake again and being haunted by it. That is greatness. We all have these voices in our head. We like to not listen to them. The one that comforts us and keeps us nice and warm and cuddly and gives us cookies and milk at nighttime and shit. We like that voice. <laughs> that voice, the one we want to always hear, which is why people don't like to listen to me a lot. Some people do, some people don't. The only thing that changes you is being real. So basically, you know, I had to have the courage to go back in there because nothing was getting done. Mm-hmm. I kept on going to that nice, cuddly voice in my head saying, you know what, you don't need to do this. That, that's too much work, man. You've earned this, mm-hmm. you deserve this. And that mentality got me to 297 pounds, fat, out of shape, to me, a loser, to me making $1,000 a month and making a ton of mistakes. Because mistakes happen on the easy side of life. You take the easy road, the easy path, there's a lot of mistakes over there. The hard journey, you don't make too many mistakes over here because it's too hard, you don't wanna repeat it. There are a lot of people that are listening right now that either are dealing with this very issue that we're talking about. When we finally left Buffalo, after all the physical and mental beatings that my dad handed out, mm-hmm. we left Buffalo and I went to a, to me, even worse environment. I went to a very small town in Brazil, Indiana, where there was about five black families. And in 1995, the KKK marched in our 4th of July parade. So that being said, it paints Brazil, Indiana, that, you know, that's the town I'm talking about, in a very bad light. Mm. And there are a lot of good people in this small town. So I want to make that very sure, clear. Sure. But what happens is when you come from a very broken foundation, yeah. your mind only sees hate and evil. Yeah. There was one time I was in my sophomore year, mm-hmm. walked in my Spanish class to get my notebook, opened my notebook up, and inside the notebook, someone drew a little character of me in a stick figure hanging from, you know, like that, like a noose. Yeah. Or like sure. a hangman game. At this time in my life, I was a sophomore and I had about a fourth grade reading level because I cheated all through school. Right. All through school I cheated because I realized I was going to get put in a special school. Right. So I found a way to get by and this right. is how I got by. Right. So what I'm getting at is all this between my stepfather getting murdered 
or soon to be stepfather get murdered, all these things compounded into the lowest of low self-esteem. Mm. So what started happening was I started lying. I became an amazing liar because I wanted people to like me. Yeah. When you come from a society like I did, I had zero self-esteem and I feared things. I had zero self-confidence mm -hmm. and I was looking for anything I could yeah. that I could gravitate to. So it was lying. Yeah. But that's when I realized, and it was a long process, that without having self-esteem, mm -hmm. you are done. Yeah. That's the number one thing you have to have in your life. It's funny that you're sitting here saying that like things like public speaking you find hard when mm -hmm. you've done all the crazy, insane stuff that you've done. Because I do them alone. Right. I do them alone. Yeah. You know, like I, I pick these hard things that most people think you can't finish anyway. So, you know, you go out there, you grind, you're alone, you're in your own head. I work best alone. Right. I work best alone. So those are easier. Mm. You know, I uh, figure out a way to kind of challenge, you know, kind of challenge uh, your mind, channel it and challenge it at the same time. And I figured out a way to kind of just become, have an indestructible toolbox mm. in your mind. So those are easier. My mind is so powerful and I didn't realize it. I went through three hell weeks, ranger school, Delta Force selection, all this stuff. This incident I'm gonna explain to you right now is where I realized we are only at 40% of what we are capable of. Here I am, right I did through this race called Badwater 135. I Googled the 10 hardest races in the world. What came up? Crazy race in Death Valley. Summertime, 135 miles. I knew nothing about ultra running. I thought you would like, you know, Camp out, run 20 miles. Then one day, then run 20 miles again until you get 135 miles. I had no idea what I was doing. Called the race director up. He's like, hey, have you run 100 miles? I was like, what, in a week or what? What are you talking about? He's like, no, in 24 hours or less. I said, no. He goes, you got to qualify to get in this race. You have to run 100 miles in 24 hours or less. He was trying to call my bluff. I call him up on a Wednesday. He goes, hey, there's a race in San Diego on Saturday where it's a 24-hour race where you run around, you know, a track, a one-mile track for 24 hours. And if you get 100 miles, I will consider you in my race. It really helps to be smart, people. And I was not smart in this situation. I thought, oh, I did the math. It's about a 14-something minute mile. I can do that. Anyway, I show up on Saturday with the blue lawn chair, Ritz Crackers, Mile Plex, and my ex-wife. And every mile I'm going to see her, I'm going to grab some Ritz Crackers and some Mile Plex. I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but it's bliss. That whole ignorance is bliss thing. So I get to 70 miles pretty damn fast. I get to 70 miles in like 12, 13 hours. What do you think happens to your body when you haven't trained for that kind of mileage? A lot of bad things, but I thought I was in good shape. It was amazing. So I hadn't gone to the bathroom at all. I sit down, big mistake. I sit down in this blue lawn chair. I sit down, looking at my ex-wife. I'm seeing like three or four of her. And I'm like, oh, oh sh this is not good. So I'm trying to play it off because I know where I'm about to go. So I'm sitting there, and when you haven't gone to the bathroom, you're dehydrated, your nutrition's all jacked up. You sit down, you gotta go to the bathroom now. So I'm sitting there, and I'm all jacked up. And I'm like, okay, how in the world am I gonna, I got 30 miles to go. I should quit, but I didn't. What I started doing through this whole process was I started to study myself in the dark times. So instead of just quitting real fast, I said, no, I'm going to quit, but not right now. So I sat back for a second and I said, let me get some water. Let me hydrate. Let me clean myself up a little. Let me get some nutrition. I wasn't dizzy. So, okay. My feet are all messed up. Let me see if I can walk. I'm going to walk one mile, then I'll go home. That would be a great accomplishment for me, 71 miles. 
So I took this massive thing and I started breaking it down into small chunks. And as I started breaking it down into small chunks, I started realizing maybe I'll walk one more mile. But at the pace I was walking, I wasn't going to make the time. So this is when I realized the whole 40% rule. Those of you who worry, you know, red can't hurt me, you understand it. Basically, the 40% rule is when we have a governor on our brains, like a governor on a car. A car may say 130, but if you put a governor on a car, it can only go 101. We do the same thing to our brains. I was born with limited horizons, born on the other side of the tracks. I didn't think I could be anybody. So my governor was myself. So once you take that governor off, you have limitless horizons. So here I am now, sitting in this chair, walk 75, I'm at 80 miles, but I'm not gonna make the time. The most amazing thing happens. The brain, the mind, the soul, the spirit, it all connected. It's never happened before like this in my entire life. I ran the next 19 miles. I ran about 10 minute mile. I finished 101 miles in 19 hours and six minutes. I'm gonna save you how the story ends because it ends real foul. It ends in a tub with me peeing Coca-Cola out of myself. It was blood and it was the best feeling I had in my entire life. I'm not sadistic, but when you push yourself to that level and accomplish something you thought was impossible, what happens to your body and mind is something I can't really even explain. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Les Brown, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. One of the first qualities of a warrior is courage. You want to live your life from now on with courage that most people 